Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Perchuk. I'm the deputy director here at the Getty Research Institute. And on behalf of myself and my fellow symposium organizers, Yvonne Safran and Laura Rivers from the Getty Museum, Tom Lerner and Alan Phoenix from the Getty Conservation Institute, and Aleka LeBlanc from the Getty Research Institute, I want to welcome you to this symposium on Jackson Pollock's mural. Today is in many ways the culmination of a nearly two-year process of the study and conservation of mural. And one of the most innovative parts of the project has been the way it has brought together conservation, conservation science, and art history. Something the Getty is particularly well positioned to accomplish because of the unique combination of the Getty Museum and the Conservation and Research Institutes. We've been organizing small meetings over the course of the project with both Getty staff and outside experts, some of whom you will hear from today. And one of the most exciting parts of the interdisciplinary dialogue has been the way it has influenced both the treatment and interpretation of mural, which you will hear about uh, this morning and throughout the day. And while some of the scholars will speak directly focusing closely on mural. Others will put the painting in context or discuss its afterlife and influence. We hope that today's symposium will continue the process of discovery and reevaluation that has characterized the entire mural project. To foster interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary exchange, we have structured today into a number of segments. In each section, presenters will speak for about 20 minutes, and they will go one after another, with each section concluding with a panel discussion among the participants. So we ask that you hold your questions until the end of each section. And we invite everyone in attendance to continue today's dialogue at a reception at the end of the day. Finally, I want to thank Sean O'Hara and the team at the University of Iowa, uh, the owners and custodians of, I of Mural, for being extraordinary partners throughout the project, and to thank the Mellon Foundation for providing the ma major funding for this initiative. I also want to thank Jennifer Schmidt, who has done an extraordinary job of organizing logistics for this event and the Getty Events and AV teams. So now please turn off your phones, and I will turn things over to Yvonne Safran, Chief Conservator of Paintings at the Getty Museum, and Tom Lerner, Chief Scientist at the Getty Conservation Institute. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. In 1943, Peggy Guggenheim commissioned Jackson Pollock to paint a mural for the entrance hall of her five-story townhouse at 155 East 61st Street in New York City. And almost as soon as it was painted, stories surfaced about the painting, stories that ha have evolved over time to almost mythic proportions, that Pollock didn't know what to paint, and that he painted mural in one very quick moment of genius inspiration. Stories about a difficult installation of the painting in Guggenheim's apartment, where the painting had to be cut to fit into the space. Questions about what kind of paint Pollock used and how he applied the paint. Both Peggy Guggenheim and his wife, Lee Krasner, told and published many dramatic stories that have been retold over the years, stories that have confused the truth and created somewhat of a confusing understanding of the history of the painting. So I'm going to try and give you a brief overview of what was known about the painting before it arrived here at the Getty. And Tom's going to tell you about how the painting came to be here at the Getty. And before, before I do that, before we do that, we'd just like to again uh, acknowledge the tremendous contributions of so many people to this project, both here at the Getty um, and around the world as well. And a number of these people are in the audience today. There's also been a great deal of scholarly work um, done before us as well. And for anyone interested in delving in deeper into Jackson Pollock, as well as Peggy Guggenheim, these books in particular are worth a look at. 
um, included the, they're the Catalogue Raisonne of Pollock's Works by Francis O'Connor and Eugene Thaw. These two volumes um, published by MoMA in conjunction with their Pollock retrospective in the 90s with, with brilliant essays by Carol Mancusiangaro, Jim Coddington, Pepe Carmel, and others. And also this book on Peggy Guggenheim's gallery, The Art of the Century, um, which was published in conjunction with an exhibition at the Guggenheim uh, with a particularly useful section uh, on the painting that is here at the Getty. Here we see a floor plan of the entry hall of Peggy's apartment, um, or a reconstruction of a floor plan, I should say. And this is where mural was to be this wall here. Originally, the idea was to have Pollock paint the work directly on the wall, but one of Peggy's advisors, Marcel Duchamp, suggested that he paint it on canvas instead in case she ever moved and wanted to take it with her. Much of what we know about the commission and creation of the painting can be learned from the correspondence of Jackson Pollock himself. And here we see a postcard that he, he wrote to his future wife, Lee Krasner, on July 15, 1943. He writes, have signed the contract and have seen the wall space for the mural. It's all very exciting. It was the largest painting Pollock had ever undertaken, and this monumental work was significant enough to, to merit this photograph of Pollock in front of the blank canvas. On July 29, 1943, Pollock wrote to his, to his brother, Charles, I have a year's contract and a large painting to do for Peggy Guggenheim's house, eight feet, 11 and a half inches by 19 feet, nine inches, with no strings as to what or how I paint it. I'm going to paint it in oil on canvas. They are giving me a show November 16th, and I want to have the painting finished for the show. I've had to tear out the partition between the front and middle room to get the damned thing up. I have it stretched now. It looks pretty big, but exciting as hell. All hell. And Lee Krasner later recalled that for that mural, we had to rip out a wall and carry out the plaster in buckets every night. The question of how long it took Pollock to paint mural has been one of the most intriguing of the uncertainties about the work. Interestingly, three photographs of the painting exist mid-process, still in the studio, and while we don't know who actually took these photos, it could have even been Pollock himself, they are rich documents for studying the progress and process of the painting and suggest a period of execution time of at least a few days. If Pollock himself is to be believed, it happened over the summer of 1943, as in January of 1944, he wrote to his brother Frank, I painted quite a large painting for Miss Guggenheim's house during the summer, eight feet by 20 feet. It was grand fun. However, in 1946, in her first autobiography, Peggy contradicts this and relates the story that is promoted by Lee Krasner and others that mural was created in one evening of frenetic activity on December 31st, 1943. Our understanding that the painting was done by, by November is supported by a letter Guggenheim writes to her friend, Emily Scarborough, indicating that mural had been completed and installed and that a party had been held in Pollock's honor. In early November of that year, she wrote, we had a party for the new genius, Jackson Pollock, who is having a show here now. He painted a 20-foot mural in my house in the entrance. There are also fascinating stories told by both Guggenheim and Lee Krasner about a problematic installation of the painting. Somehow the painting was bigger than its intended space and had to be cut to fit into the tight area. In Guggenheim's third autobiography, published in 1979, she says, we had great trouble in installing this enormous mural, which was bigger than the wall it was destined for. Pollock tried to do it himself, but not succeeding, he became quite hysterical. Finally, Marcel Duchamp and a workman came to the rescue and placed the mural. It looked very fine, but I'm sure it needed a much bigger space. 
In the fall of 1946, George, the photographer George Carger recorded Pollock and Guggenheim in front of the painting in this memorable photograph. It's the only photograph we have of mural actually in place in the apartment. The next time we see it is in this equally famous photograph. It is presumed that the painting left Guggenheim's apartment in early 1947. By this point, both Pollock and the painting are famous, and the painting is soon to be on view at the Museum of Modern Art. And Pollock has himself photographed with the painting in this very formal photograph by Herbert Matter, taken at Vogue Studio. Interestingly, the painting has not yet been signed nor dated. And here we see the painting hanging at MoMA in the exhibition Large Scale Modern Paintings, um, which opened, uh, which took place in March and April of 1947. I'm sorry, April through May of 1947, where it hangs, where it hung in company with works by great contemporary modernist artists. And the painting really confirms Pollock at that point as one of the leading artists of his time. And in the summer of that year, Peggy offers mural to Yale University as a donation. She's moving back to Europe, and the painting is too big for her to take with her. The painting goes on view at Yale University Art Gallery, but the university does not accept the donation. Presumably, it's a bit too wild and crazy for them. So in 1948, Peggy offers the painting to the University of Iowa, and they accept but the painting does not arrive in Iowa until October of 1951. And here you see um, one of the letters, uh, one of the first letters Peggy wrote uh, to Iowa, to Lester Longman, who was the head of the art department at the time. Um, and I, if you're interested in, in why it took so long for the painting to get from Yale to Iowa, uh, the University of Iowa has posted all of the correspondence online, and it's a, a fascinating read. And here in the, in the photograph here, you see mural hanging in, in one of the um, art studios early on. I know that was a lot of information to review in a short period of time. You're gonna see some of these same photographs, I know, in some later talks, um, which we'll present in, in more detail about the, the issues that I've introduced. Um, but now I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Lerner, who's gonna talk about how the painting came to be here at the Getty. Uh, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome from uh, me as well. Um, I'm just going to complete the context of the reason why we're here today um, and jump from 1951, uh, the painting arriving at the University of Iowa, to um, 2009, when uh, the then director of the University of Iowa Museum of Art, um, interim director, I should say, Pamela White, um, who I'd forgotten I'd met uh, in 2007 in my first year here, uh, she was, on, she was uh, doing the Getty Leadership Institute course. Um, she wrote to me and um, made a proposal that perhaps the Getty might like to take on this extraordinary project. Um, she'd actually done a lot of homework, and she had figured out everything that Andrew mentioned at the start of his talk um, about how this project might fit in so well to the Getty's mission. She knew everything about the GCI's Modern Paints project, she knew that the Getty Museum took on works from outside collections, and obviously she knew about the Getty Research Institute's interest in art historical research. Um, it was an instant uh, buzz for, for me. I, I went to see the painting. I met Sean O'Hara uh, there as well, who was then uh, executive director of the Figgy Art Museum, who was, which was housing uh, Mural. Um, and then, in fact, Yvonne tells this story much better than me, um, but there was then quite a sort of long uh, time where within the Getty we had to figure out could we actually take on this project. Um, but needless to say, everyone at the Getty got behind this project. Uh, Scott Schaefer, who's here in the audience, um, was very, very keen. Andrew Perchart was immediately keen. Yvonne needed a little bit more persuasion, um, but this was largely down to the fact that the painting is so large. Um, and that really there hadn't been a, a huge amount of uh, instances where 20th century paintings had come into the Getty mu uh, Museum. Um, but we got through those differences and, and uh, discussions, um, 
And then I think it was uh, 2010 when we all went to visit the painting one more time, realized that this was really going to be quite possible. Um, and in 2012, uh, the painting arrived here. Um, and it's, uh, we are now almost two years later. Um, I'm sure it's been mentioned, um, but the painting is currently up in an exhibition, which runs through June the 1st. Um, it's a very busy schedule today, but there is, are some breaks at lunch in particular uh, to run along and see the, the exhibition. Uh, we've been absolutely thrilled by it. Um, and I think just to finish this off, I'm, we're just going to show um, a very short uh, movie. The, the project has been uh, heavily documented all the way through, um, and this is just a very short movie that shows some of the clips of the painting um, actually arriving here uh, to set the scene. Why don't we just... Uh... Yeah. yeah, it's a very nice <laughs> video scene, but it's now, now we can't really play it because we've built up all these expectations. Um, so I, I think we'll, we'll try and play that maybe in one of the breaks. Um, I'm actually now going to hand over to Yvonne, uh, who will be chairing the first session in today's symposium. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. <laughs> The next session has three speakers, and I'm going to introduce them all um, at once um, so that we have a nice flow to the morning. Laura Rivers will be the first speaker. She holds a master's in art history from the University of Chicago, uh, where she had a focus on modern and contemporary art. And she also has a master's in art conservation from the Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation, where she specialized in paintings. Her conservation training included time spent at the National Gallery of Art Washington, the Barnes Foundation, Cram Cranmer Art Conservation in New York, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the J. Paul Getty Museum. From 2007 to 2010, she worked on modern and contemporary art at the Manil Con Collection in Houston, Texas. A former Getty graduate intern, she returned to the Getty in the fall of 2010, where she is now associate paintings conservator and one of my colleagues. Alan is a paintings conservator as well, an, education and a conserva an educator and a conservation scientist. He is presently scientist at the Getty Conservation Institute, working partly for the collections research laboratory and partly for the modern and contemporary art research group. His current work mostly involves paint analysis and materials testing. For the last few months, Alan has been on short-term leave from the Getty, teaching for one semester at New York University's conservation program at the Institute of Fine Arts as Judith Praska Distinguished Visiting Professor. And I'm, while I'm sure this was wonderful for NYU, all of us here at the Getty have missed him terribly, and we are happy that he's returning soon. Michael Schreak is Associate Professor of Art History at Trinity University in San Antonio. He earned his master's degree in art history at the University of Texas at Austin. He continued his graduate coursework at Northwestern University and entered his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. He was a recipient of pre-doctoral fellowships from the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Getty Research Institute and he's recently been named a Terra Foundation Visiting Professor at the JFK Institute for North American Studies at the Freie University in Berlin. He's published numeral, numerous critical essays on Pollock, Barnett Newman, Hans Hoffmann, Cy Twombly, and he's currently completing a book entitled Jackson Pollock and the Perception of Abstract Expressionism. And so now I'm pleased to welcome uh, Laura Rivers to give her talk. Good morning. Yvonne has given us the background on Mural um, and its many moves. I will continue the story of Mural by telling you about the material history of the painting, the changes it has undergone since it left Pollock's studio, the conservation treatment it underwent in 1973, and the past two years here at the Getty. All of these changes, those that are the effects of time, and those that are the result of direct intervention, have influenced our experience of mural, and that's what I hope to show you today. First, I would like to step back for a moment and consider what the journey to Iowa ultimately um, meant for mural. Large paintings like mural often lead difficult lives. Because of their size and considerable weight, they are more susceptible to the forces of gravity than smaller paintings. 
They become splayed out at the corners or begin to sag in the middle as gravity takes its toll. Such was the case with Mural. Large paintings are often rolled on long cardboard tubes to make transporting them easier. As Mural moved from Pollock's studio to Guggenheim's entrance hall and from there to Vogue Studios, on to MoMA, up to Yale, the painting was rolled and unrolled, stretched and unstretched at least five times, all before it even arrived in Iowa. I would like to ask you to revisit this image for a moment, this one here, and note that the painting is clearly propped up um, at either end, and you can tell from the space at the floor in front of Pollock here, and then again at the back. So one can easily see how applying paint to a canvas so positioned might actually lock in that sag over time, or immediately. Over the course of the project, we began to believe that mural sag had developed quite early on. Thanks to the intrepid research of art historian Angelica Rudenstein, who I believe is in the audience today, and the efforts of the Museum of Modern Art archivists, we now know for certain that mural sag dates at least to 1947, a mere four years after the painting was created. Here you see mural at MoMA in the large scale, oops, uh, modern paintings exhibition. That was the previous slide. In a letter from curator Margaret Miller to George Hamilton of Yale University Art Gallery, Miller warns Hamilton that the canvas is warped in the center in such a way that it can never be stretched true again. Here are a few condition notes from the 1947 exhibition. Barely four years after its creation, you can see that Mural had several small losses, um, cracking, flaking, and even a nail scrape. Um, as I said, large paintings lead difficult lives. 20 years later, in 1967, Mural was on the move again, traveling from Iowa to MoMA for a retrospective of Pollock's work. This proved to be a crucial turning point in the material life of Mural. MoMA conservator Jean Volkmer found the stretcher inadequate and observed that it had actually cracked in one place. Please do take note, this is the first stretcher Mural cracked. You can see the sag quite clearly in this detail. Volkmer also notes areas of cracking and lifting paint. She advised lining the painting. Mural would have its first major intervention. Lining is a process that involves adhering a new secondary canvas to the back of the original canvas for added support. During the lining process, the original canvas is infused with adhesive, either directly or when the two canvases are adhered to one another. This can serve to secure flaking paint. It also supports the original canvas. At the time, lining was a standard and well-accepted treatment for the kinds of problems that Mural exhibited, although not necessarily the same approach that would be taken today. The man hired to undertake this daunting task was Louis Pomerantz. Pomerantz was a well-respected colleague in the field, having established the conservation laboratory at the Art Institute of Chicago. By 1973, he was a well-respected colleague and rather a hired gun in the field, the perfect person to take on such a monumental treatment. This is the 1972 condition report, and I wanted to highlight just a few notes. Um, my favorite is, is not a generally, you know, is not in a generally sound state when describing the paint film. Other small details are included um, as described before. The other thing to note in these two um, photographs, which are detailed photographs of the painting, the scratch that you see, which was described in 1947, is interesting because it interrupts the flow of the brush strokes. And that's sort of an important thing to keep in mind about um, how our visual experience of paintings changes when you have small damages. In preparation for lining mural, Pomerantz prepared 50 pounds of a wax and resin adhesive. The wax resin formula is one that Claire Toussaint, our graduate intern this year, and I later mixed up in order to better understand the material we were dealing with, and that's what you see across the bottom. Once the lining was completed, the next step would have been measuring and marking out what would become the new turnover edge, and that's what you see them doing here. So this is actually on a working stretcher, mural on a working stretcher. I've included this image of the turnover edge here just to clarify, and for all those doubters, there are four complete turnover edges, and four complete tacking margins 
um, the mural was never cut down. And we're simply confirming research that a number of colleagues, particularly Carol Mancusi Garo, Jim Coddington, and Angelica Rudenstein have spent many years clarifying and putting out there. Um, anyone who still doubts, I have 400 images of the tacking margins. <laughs> see me at the coffee break. Um, so here um, you can see this is actually the tacking margin. So it's splayed out flat at this point. And what they're doing is um, marking out where the new rectangular stretcher, where the turnover edge will be. This is a chalk line here. Um, so basically determining the new turnover edge. This is mural almost 40 years after the lining upon its arrival at the Getty in July of 2012. You can see the exposed tacking margins. Those areas are marked in red. Here's a detail just to make it a little bit clearer. And I would also ask you to note at the bottom, oops, at the bottom here, um, this is the detail of the tacking margin. And so this would have been on the bottom of the painting, on the edge, when the painting left Pollock's studio. And now, after the lining, it is now on the face, along with the sections at the top and on the left. And I wanted to give you a look at the 1973 stretcher as it appeared on arrival at the Getty. And just to clarify, this is the stretcher here. And we are looking at the back of the lining canvas, not the reverse of the original canvas. And again, for any tacking margin doubters, um, these are the tacking margins here. They are obscured here by an um, easel that was built um, by our preparations department in order to support the painting during the conservation treatment. Overall, the lining was rather sensitively done, um, and it did successfully stabilize the flaking paint. We have um, more of mural today because of this lining. The lining was quite intact when it arrived at the Getty, and it has held up beautifully over 40 years. Pomerantz got the job done, and he did it well. During the 1973 treatment, the painting was also varnished with solubar, a synthetic acrylic varnish. Due to the way Pollock was adjusting the paint with Alan, um, which Alan Phoenix will tell you more about in just a few moments. Pollock had achieved a varied surface with wonderful gloss and matte details. And it is important to note that Pollock did not varnish the painting originally. Varnish actually has a tendency to even out the surface of a painting and can really obscure variation in gloss and matte. Additionally, it can sort of clog up the texture of a brush stroke and you really lose a sense of the artist moving across the canvas with a brush. The choice to varnish the painting was consistent with standard practice at that moment in time. The varnish was intended to protect the surface of the painting. This image was taken in 2012 when the painting arrived at the Getty. It was taken in specular light, which essentially means that direct light coming essentially from where you're sitting was, shine, was shown directly on the painting in order to accentuate the um, even um, and, and shiny effects of the um, varnish, so literally to induce glare. And this is an important image to understand because when Mural arrived, it was very difficult to take in the entire painting all at once. One had to sort of move around in order to dodge the glare, which is what these gentlemen are doing. <laughs> Why have I told you this tale of change? Because all of the movement, all the small damages, and the interventions they necessitated have influenced how, pa how the painting has been seen for the past 40 years and will continue to influence how the painting is seen in the foreseeable future, or always. And I have left out many of the stories of all the other small interventions that took place over the years, and that was done in the interest of time. The tacking margin on the face of the painting represents a disruption to the edge of the painting as Pollock intended them. The varnish changed the surface and altered the viewer's experience of the painting. Over time, it had also become increasingly cloudy. In short, the painting now looked very different than it did when it left Pollock's studio. Additionally, the 1973 stretcher was not supporting the heavy double canvas as well as it might. And remember, there's 50 pounds of wax resin adhesive as well. Mural had actually cracked another stretcher. Essentially, these were the issues we faced when Mural arrived at the Getty. The conservation treatment we undertook was very much 
dictated by Mural's early history and the choices made during the 1973 treatment. And like all conservation treatments, the artist's intent was really at the center of our work. What did Pollock intend? What did he want us to see? How did he want his painting presented? And these are all tricky, complicated questions. We hope to remove the varnish and recover something closer to the surface that Pollock had intended. We hope to improve the structural integrity of the painting and in the process, consider how the aesthetic issue of the tacking margins might be addressed. All work of this sort begins with a great deal of looking. Examination and documentation are really at the center of what we do, and we spend a lot of time looking before we do anything. Conservators tend to be rather conservative. We use mic microscopes and magnifying loops, and we look at the painting with the variety of techniques listed here. And this is actually an edited list. Essentially, we do a lot of looking and thinking before we do anything else. Alan's presentation will cover some even more unusual examination techniques that we were able to bring to bear on mural. Once we had examined and documented the painting, we moved forward with the cleaning. The first step was a surface cleaning intended to remove the surface grime accumulated over the years from the varnish and essentially get it out of the way before we began removing the varnish. We used an aqueous solution um, applied with swabs rolled across the surface. There were a lot of cotton swabs. Here you see Lauren Bradley, who was the assistant conservator on the project, removing surface grime. The next step was removing the varnish. We knew from early testing that the varnish could be removed with a number of solvents. However, after further testing, we were able to sort of get down to one solvent that really um, was able to remove the varnish effectively and without um, any issues for the paint. Again, we used hand-wound cotton swabs gently rolled across the surface, and we used a lot of cotton swabs. Um, at the lower right, you see Johanna Ellersdorfer, who was our graduate intern and participated in the project as well. Here you see a detail of the painting taken in specular light before and during cleaning. I've left the cleaning line here at the bottom, and that's sort of what this is here, just to give you a better sense of the change in the surface before and after the cleaning. So this is a during um, cleaning image. The removal of the varnish revealed a varied surface with areas of matte and glossy paint, which is what we would have expected based on what we were seeing with the analytical work that was going on in parallel, and Alan will be telling you more about that. And also, we spent a great deal of time looking at other paintings in order to understand how Pollock was working at this moment in time. The varnish was quite thick, and removing it also restored that sense of subtle te texture that I was describing earlier. Additionally, the sense of space in the painting um, became less compressed as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you um, the after cleaning image, but truthfully, the better after cleaning image is upstairs in the galleries. So I encourage you all to go and visit. Don't look at this. Um, the cleaning was relatively straightforward and actually the, the biggest change really is the ability to take the painting in all at once and also the, the opening up of, of space in this, in this if, that had formerly been quite compressed. So the cleaning was relatively straightforward. The structural issues were a bit more complex. When conservators have a large or difficult problem, we often turn to our colleagues and rely on collective expertise when considering how to approach our work. Thanks to the Mellon Foundation, we were able to host a series of meetings really bringing together everyone that we wanted to hear from, um, although unfortunately not everyone was able to attend. But it was a wonderful opportunity to bring together people who'd, who had worked on paintings by Jackson Pollock, who had worked on massive wax linings, um, who um, had also dealt with some of the interpretive problems looking at the work, and it was a really exciting few um, days. Essentially, there were two options, and this is the first one. The first option was to place the painting on a rectangular stretcher maintaining the 1973 edges, and that was sort of the least interventive option, and so that's what you see here. 
The second option was to place the painting on a shape stretcher. And in order to do that, it was a rather difficult construction job in terms of building, a rather difficult job to build a stretcher of that shape. But it essentially would allow us to return the painting to the historical edges. And that was something that was very interesting and rather appealing. However, um, so shape stretchers are actually a pretty common solution for paintings of this size that um, have these kinds of distortions. It, it has been done, certainly. Um, however, the distortion with mural was more extreme, and we weren't entirely certain that um, the eye would be fooled. And it's, in essence, um, what the goal is, is um, to basically fool the eye for that crucial moment that would allow a viewer to see the painting first and perhaps notice the distortion second. Like Margaret Miller in 1947 and Louis Pomerantz in 1973, we also briefly considered the option of framing out the slivers of the tacking margin. However, the styles of frames generally used for Pollock made that option impractical. Also, aside from the MoMA exhibition frame, which we now know most certainly was an exhibition frame, again, thanks to Angelica and the MoMA archivists, um, Mural had never really had a frame. In order to evaluate what the effect of a shaped canvas would be, um, the Department of Imaging Services here at the Getty actually undertook their own monumental project. They printed out a full-size digital image of the painting, and the framer in our department, Jean Carricker, actually built it out. It's not built out and cut in this um, image, but later we cut it according to the shape that we were considering and had it built out, Jean built it out, to um, give us a sense of the depth of the painting and how that would look on the wall. Once we'd seen the mock-up, um, even those who'd been rather conservative in terms of thinking about whether or not the painting should go on to a shaped canvas began to really feel that it did. The painting began to work in a very different way, and it was really immediately remarkable. However, it is one thing to shape a paper version of a painting, and quite another thing to shape a 70-year-old painting with double canvas and 50 pounds of lining adhesive. We were not entirely certain that the painting would go along with the plan. The process of answering that question involved a lot of small tests and a very careful progression toward action. In order to adjust the turnover edges, we began by making a mylar tracing of the turnover edge based on the available physical evidence, and that is what you see us doing here. That mylar template was then turned into a mylar pattern and the mylar pattern was then made into a wooden um, stretcher template pattern, um, actually by Lauren Vincent, Vincent and Tony Moreno in the Department of Preparations here at the Getty. So we then flipped over the painting, removed the old stretcher, and then what you see here is actually the process of transferring the new slash old, in other words, the new slash purportedly historical, um, tacking edge back onto the canvas. So what you're looking at is the reverse of the lining canvas here. Um, there's a piece of mylar, so no Sharpie was actually used on the painting. Um, these are registration marks um, from brush strokes on the front of the painting so that we knew where we were. This is a pouncing tool that was used um, to gently mark the wax so that we would have something to work towards. So here, it was necessary to separate the um, edges of the tacking margin in order to move one canvas at a time. If you think about two things together, they have to move against one another in order to reach a 90 degree angle. So here you see the wooden template um, in place and we are adjusting the turnover edge, one canvas at a time. And it's really quite crucial to check your work. So this is what you see me doing here. This, um, and there's my colleagues on either side. Um, and what you can see here, the painting is face down, and this is the edge of mural in the mirror. So here we have um, Lauren and Tony, um, and the nearly finished stretcher, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment. 
But first, um, working with Tony and Lauren gave me some really interesting insight, gave all of us some really interesting insight into the installation myth, which Yvonne described, and which has been rather thoroughly disproved by um, a number of our colleagues previously. Um, and Carolyn Cousangaro and Jim Coddington and Angelica Rudenstein had been interested in these, oh my, had been interested in these tacking holes on the edge of the painting for a number of years. And one of the ideas that, had been, that they had put forth was that the canvas had been wrapped around the stretcher, um, the excess canvas had been wrapped around the stretcher in order to allow the painting to fit into the space. The question of how the stretcher um, you know, was cut down, because that seemed like a rather difficult operation, was something that we hadn't quite worked out. Um, but truthfully, Tony and Lauren, who are connoisseurs of pre-power um, tool woodshop skills, woodworking skills, really felt that actually it wouldn't be that difficult. And so looking at this image, um, which we were standing around in the gallery talking one day, we looked at the joins um, here and here. And if you look carefully, you can see this is a lap join. So one possibility is that it might have been cut off here, taken apart, and then cut off here and here. But in thinking about how difficult it is to stretch a large painting, that seems somewhat impractical. And they both felt the more practical solution would actually be to cut a new miter here and here. Um, and that actually, given the, the facility with hand tools that would have been pre prevalent in the 1940s and it wouldn't have even taken particularly exotic tools, very simple tools, that it would actually be possible to do this on the fly in Peggy Guggenheim's vestibule. I was haunted by my failed dovetail joint in conservation school. Okay. So here is the image of the fabulous new stretcher, which we really hope will never crack um, and that we will, um, that mural will remain on for a number of years. And it was built from kiln-dried Alaskan cedar, which is an extraordinary wood. The basswood tacking edge was useful for ease of insertion um, and removal of the tacks. Um, we used expansion bolts, which we hoped we wouldn't need the expansion, but we wanted it to be present for the future. Um, and the other salient features are, um, these Dibon panels, which um, this is the back of the stretcher. So these panels are actually up against the surface, not quite touching it, but near the surface. And that helps with mitigation um, with vibration during transit. It also is protection in case of impact from the front. And it wonderfully allows us to stretch the painting face up. And that's what you see my colleagues and I doing here. Um, this is actually a preliminary stretching, and so we're using tacking, um, just push pins, in order to set the painting in the appropriate spot. And here you see just a few of the things we use. These are actually the 1973 staples, um, copper-coated steel tacks, mylar isolators, so basically to isolate the metal from the canvas, and copper is more stable than steel, but still we don't trust it entirely. Um, and then these are the temporary push pins that we used. So here, um, this is actually in-painting of the edges. Um, and that was, the, the in-painting was done um, really along the edges in order to minimize the um, visual distraction of some of the losses from old turnover damage. And in painting on the face of the painting was mainly focused on resolving situations where compositional elements were disrupted by loss. And so that's what you see us doing here. This is mural with its new stretcher and without its old varnish on the wall in the galleries here. And I do encourage you to go see it. Much of the work we do in conservation involves undoing the work of those who come before us. Louis Pomerantz's 1973 treatment was a treatment that had achieved its goals and had been very successful in stabilizing the painting. We were able to work with it rather than undoing it, and that was a great pleasure. Once a painting, or really any large work of art, leaves an artist's studio, it becomes subject to countless small and large changes, intentional and unintentional, which profoundly influence our experience of that work of art. As viewers, an understanding of the ways in which a work of art has changed can profoundly inform our understanding of it. 
Removing the 1973 varnish really res restored the subtle play of gloss and matte areas on the surface. Placing the painting on a shape stretcher restored a certain energy to the painting and reestablished the visual boundaries of the painting. Mural is now much closer to how it looked when Pollock first painted it. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to start with the same opening slide that Laura did uh, to talk about the sort of materials and technique uh, aspects of the uh, Pollock project. Um, I have to apologize for the rather um, chatty title, Staring at the Wall, Investigations of Technique, Material and Technique in Jackson's Pollock, Jackson Pollock's Mural. I don't mean to imply any sense of ennui or boredom in, in this. What I'm trying to convey is that there's, as, as Laura suggested, a great deal of looking um, has gone into the, the activities of the, the last two years or so. And essentially, part of my job uh, doing the scientific technical studies to try and unravel, try and extract from the material and structure of the painting itself evidence that informs an understanding of the, the creative process, how and with what uh, Pollock went about creating this fantastic work of art, but also to try and find out things about how uh, and what has happened to the painting through the passage of time. So it's a good starting point, the same slide of how, we, how Pollock went from this blank canvas through to the finished work uh, immediately on completion, but also as we see the painting now. Um, Yvonne uh, invoked this uh, wonderful quote from the, the letter that Pollock wrote to his brother Charles in the uh, summer of 1943 about the commission. And I've just wanted to highlight one thing that Pollock says. I'm going to paint it in oil on canvas. And rather, I don't want to kind of undermine what comes next, but essentially he lived up to his uh, stated goal that what we'll find is that actually mural is largely painted in oil on canvas, as he suggested. I love this uh, um, quote at the end. I've stretched it now. It looks pretty big, but as exciting as all hell. And I have to admit that it is big and exciting as all hell. And certainly when I first saw the, the piece in uh, the Figure Art Museum in, in Iowa, I thought, how the heck am I going to make sense of this? It, there's a lot of paint on mural uh, and a lot of different colors of paint applied in all kinds of different ways. And to be honest, I was rather terrified by the prospect of trying to make sense of this um, work of art. But actually, it, it isn't chaotic. Uh, we, we've heard the, uh, lots of comment on, on uh, no ca chaos, damn it, in previous studies of Pollock. There's a lot more order and method to it than perhaps meets the eye. Uh, I just wanted to sort of pick out some of the the sort of complexity of paint applications and colors that we're dealing with. Just picking out this sort of detail in the, the sort of center left of the, the painting, giving you some idea of just the diversity of paint colors and applications in one small area. And then if you extrapolate that across the entire uh, 20 foot by uh, eight feet area, it's, it's a great deal of material to try to comprehend from the technical scientific point of view. We've got everything from bare canvas to very thin down paints, splattered paints in yellow, red, uh, very impasted paints, and sort of all kinds of different uh, characters of paint. And that's what I've been trying to do mostly, is extract evidence from uh, the paint about, uh, both in terms of the chemical composition, but also the structure of the paint uh, that might inform an understanding of the creative process. As uh, we'll hear more about the canvas uh, itself uh, after the coffee break from Isabel Duvenois, uh, who will expand on, on the canvas aspect. As uh, Laura suggested, this is a commercially primed linen canvas. Uh, it has a double ground, a uh, uh, first ground of zinc white in oil, um, over which is a thin lead white ground. Uh, this is a commercial preparation. Pollock didn't put this uh, priming on the canvas itself. It was commercially prepared. But it, the canvas is this strange basket weave 
Um, you can sense this is a, a, a macro photograph of it, which is a three over two basket weave. It means that there are three um, uh, uh, warp yarns uh, crossing over two weft yarns. It's a very distinctive canvas uh, structure that gives the surface a very distinctive appearance. And, and the surface qualities of, of the canvas, I think, are, are kind of a part and parcel of the subtle variation of of surface that um, Pollock was achieving in the, execu the creation of, of mural. And I just wanted to, because it came up yesterday in the study day, looking at this detail very close up, seeing how dark some of these little tiles of overlapping yarns have become. And this is one of the very subtle uh, visual changes that have occurred over time, partly through the absorption of the uh, wax into the entire porous structure of the painting. As Laura said, Louis Pomerantz and the, the lining from 1973 did a great job in stabilizing the, the painting and preserving it for the future. But there are these very subtle uh, optical changes that occur over time and a slight loss in brightness and uh, t uh, contrast, or particularly brightness in, in the priming is one of those uh, it's kind of negative qualities that, or uh, negative factors that have come from that lining process. But the paint has been my main area of activity, and the questions that are sort of kind of set implicitly in, in these kind of studies are, well, what kinds of paint is, is there? What binders, what pigments? Uh, can we say anything about the supply or, or, or quality or uh, anything to do with the, the material itself from which the work is made? Uh, can we a answer any questions about the process? How long the paint, the, the painting process uh, took? Was it quick? Was it done in one, one vigorous session, as, as the, the myth might have it? Can we say anything about the, the application techniques? Was it done horizontally, on the floor, vertically, combinations of both? Uh, all kinds of evidence from the, the paint itself. One, I guess one of the, the sort of main areas of interest with a an innovative artist uh, like Pollock is whether there are any distinctive uh, or unusual practices that are either characteristic of this work or any uh, uh, his practice in general in this particular period. And co co this, I think this is one of the areas that will develop out of this study is the comparison with other works, particularly from the middle and later part of 1943. And, and again, from the conservation point of view, one of the things I'm looking for is any evidence of deterioration or change in the original material that might be useful for understanding the long-term uh, conservation and preservation uh, issues to, connected with the painting. So what I'm going to offer now is really a, a glimpse of what we've done uh, regarding the technical study. I'm not going to go into any of the scientific detail at all. Uh, you'll be glad to know, uh, the, shameless plug, all of that's included in the book that goes along with the exhibition that I encourage you to buy. Um, all the technical detail is there in the appendix at the back. Uh, so I won't be showing any graphs or plots or anything like that. I'm trying not to avoid any acronyms. This is my only little acronym slide. So we did a whole set to answer these kind of questions. We used a lot of the analytical instrumentation that we have in GCI, uh, going through a lot of optical microscopy. I've spent a lot of time at the microscope. Scanning electron microscopy with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. I did it. <laughs> a lot of time spent doing that. Uh, Fourier transform infrared spectro micro spectroscopy. That's the micro FCIR. Micro Raman spectroscopy, X-ray fluorescence, X-ray diffraction and gas chromatography, mass spectrometry for the binding medium analysis. So those are the techniques, um, and I'm going to concentrate really on what those have found out rather than what they do. One of the things that is a standard technique in um, paint analysis or pa a study of painting techniques is, is taking tiny samples and mounting them as little cross sections that you kind of see the sort of sequence. It's like looking at a cliff face. You see the sort of accumulation of layers from the ground. This is actually the zinc white ground. There's a le thin layer of lead white there. All the various paint applications up. In fact, there's a thin layer of varnish at the top. And I'm, we've taken quite a number of cross sections. I won't say exactly how many. The, uh, one thing that's about sampling 
it's, it is invasive, admittedly, but the samples we take are, are absolutely tiny. To give you some clue of scale, this line here is 100 microns. That's a tenth of a millimeter. So they're tiny samples that are taken from the edges of the painting, or more usually from the edges of damages that already exist in the painting that, that Laura showed in uh, the condition report. And this is a huge data set. The cross sections have multiple layers. And we've been through essentially analyzing not only individual layers, but individual particles within layers. There's a hundreds of hours of analysis that have gone into this. And we're looking at both very kind of broad patterns of, of uh, occurrences of particular paints, or even down to examining one particular pigment particle. And so we're, the important thing in all of this is both looking at the global set, but also minor, minor details. Just to give you some examples, it's fairly evident that this pink paint is pretty much the same as this pink paint, as that pink paint. They're applied in different ways, but they are essentially the same paint. But then in terms of the detail, you might see that they're all, in this sample, between the yellow here, there are a few blue, greenish particles. Really just a tiny, tiny bit of paint, but that's significant. And that we can uh, make correlations between that occurrence and why it's happened there with other samples. So it's, it's really looking broadly at, at, and broadly and deeply at the, the evidence. So I'm just going to take one particular cross-section. This is our glory cross-section because it's got so much in it, uh, conscious of time. Um, there really is a, a whole story around this one sample. It comes from down here. This is the damage uh, that it comes from. I'm going to whiz through this. Really, how tiny. You see these little flakes. It's really taken from the edge here. And it's this uh, flesh-colored paint over this, what we call gray-green, and then it even catches that thin dribble of pink paint that cuts through it. So we're seeing the entire sequence. We've got pink over. And so this gray-green is exactly the same as this gray-green. So he's using the same paint at different intervals. In fact, these are from very different stages in the creative process. This is uh, part of the very early sort of uh, development and solidification phase of the composition. These two layers are from the very final retouching campaign. One of the interesting samples was, was this one. It looks, again, it's the gray-green, but this kind of opened up the box to understanding uh, the, the main bulk of the paint materials that are on mural. And it's, it's from down here. It's a little chunk of impasto from this stroke of paint here. And it's a real mishmash of stuff. I spent hours, again, going through analyzing individual pigment particles in this paint. And the interesting thing about this paint is that it's made up of all the colors that occur in all the other oil paints of mural. It's basically the mix of all paints. Um, and again, we'll, we'll see that that's a, a practice that occurs similarly in, in this uh, period in other works by Pollock very shortly. So having realized that, we were able to sort of reconstruct the starting palette of all the stock oil paints that Pollock uh, used to create all the mixes of paint uh, on, on mural. And so the palette is essentially this. These are all the, the paints from which mural are made, the oil paints, are in this range. And actually, this is the, the list of colors. Bone black, a mix of titanium and zinc white, Vermilion, which is this sort of orange-red hue, uh, cadmium red, then there's an alizarin crimson, so there are three different reds in there. Cadmium lemon and a cadmium yellow medium, that's these two. Again, two gr different transparent greens, there's a phthal oh, I can never say phthalocyanine green and viridian, two transparent greens. And then the interesting thing is the range of blues. We've got cerulean blue, phthalo blue, and cobalt blue, and finally, umber, probably a, a burnt umber. So that's the palette. There are a few kind of minor ingredients that are actually indications of adulteration or topping off to make the paint go further or for economic reasons by the paint manufacturer, but they're minor constituents. All of those paints are in a drying oil, mostly linseed oil, 
um, and they're very good quality paints. One of the things that we can tell is the lack of cheap, inorganic, color colorless extenders that have uh, been added to make the paint go further. The only paint that has any extender is the alizarin crimson. That becomes important shortly. Um, so all of the paints in Mural are oil paints, except one. And this is the sort of odd thing, the sort of idiosyncratic occurrence in Mural and a very distinctive feature of Pollock's practice in the creation of this uh, spectacular work of art. And it's this paint here, these two, those two paints, again, he's using the same paint at different levels in the process, are different from all the rest. It first shows up uh, in the pigments. The pigments of this and this layer are lithopone, which is a co-precipitation of barium sulfate and zinc sulfide. And then it has lots of cheap extenders, mostly silicates. These are clay-type minerals, kaolin, talc, and mica. And we think that this is probably a retail trade paint or a house paint, uh, a, a cheap material that is a, a not an artist quality paint. But the big sort of eye-opener really was the examination of the binding medium of this. There's no oil present. The binding medium for this paint and this paint is casein, which is a protein derived from milk. It's, it's milk paint. Um, and to give you some idea, I bought this on eBay a, a few months ago. We think that this paint is a kind of cheap economy water-based, this is the key point, uh, water-based paint that might have been intended for interior walls. The key point being that water and oil generally don't like being together. Water and oil don't mix, and there are consequences for that. And in fact, much of the uh, flaking and uh, condition history of uh, mural may be strongly related to the presence of this um, casein paint. I'm not suggesting that the actual brand is this Firestone brand, but this is the, the kind of thing. It could have come like this as a powder that they would, the artist would have mixed with water himself, or it might have even been supplied as a ready-mixed water uh, uh, dispersion. So how am I doing? So this um, house paint is used repeatedly through particularly the, the middle phase of painting, and it's got a very distinctive use. This is a detail from the top left corner, which is very unworked compared to the rest of the paint. And you see these large areas where the white ground, this is the lead white ground, is left exposed to create the, the white background for the, the composition. But one of the things that happens in all his vigorous working is the clarity of those reserve spaces becomes blurred and indistinct. So the, it seems that the, this house paint is used primarily to recover a sort of editing and erasing of the um, uh, blurriness to those spaces during the course of the, of, as the composition develops. So this is the sort of white uh, ground, but you see this paint down here, this off-white paint, close up it looks like this. He's filling in those background reserves, and we think the properties of water-based quick drying, covering, uh, so he can get on with it, he can deal with the problem, uh, not slow down the creative process and get back to the process of developing the composition. So it's kind of like an erasing uh, recovery process. Now one of the techniques that we had the good fortune to apply to the study of, of um, mural is a, a fairly cutting edge technique. This was, work was done by John Delaney who's a, an imaging specialist at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., a technique called hyperspectral imaging. And essentially, this is like doing whole object spectroscopy. What it do, involves is capturing an image of the painting using very specific or wave bands in the, near, in the visible and near-infrared region that are specific to particular compounds or colorants. Or, and it was a, a quirk of good... Um, fortuitous situation that apart from this house paint, we have very few silicate extenders in the painting. The paint is really good quality. And so John was able to pick out the presence of that house paint on the basis of one absorption band uh, that's specific to those silicate extenders. So it's a minor component in the paint. And map or depict, uh, this is an actual image uh, acquired digitally from the, the painting 
using that one particular wave band, showing the distribution of that paint across the entire surface. And if you look carefully, say this area, I can never, yes, that, that area here has got, uh, has been filled in effectively. You can see that it's, it's the white spaces between, or the light spaces between all the linear shapes where this um, uh, paint primarily occurs. So this is the paint in one of the few areas where it actually goes over darker paint. And you can see this, it's got a very distinctive quality. It's almost ghostly. And this paint has got some conservation problems associated with it. It appears to have gone significantly more transparent and darker now than it was originally. Uh, we know that uh, there are passages where it shows very poor combat uh, compatibility with the oil. There are areas where it's brittle and clearly adhering rather poorly to the underlying oil paint with consequent flaking and cracking. So this, we think, is very strongly uh, implicated in some of the conservation issues. Um, so we were able to pick out quite a lot of the, the colorants uh, uh, in the painting and it, using the hyperspectral imaging technique to extrapolate what we found in tiny little uh, cross sections from localized places across the entire painting surface. And I'm just gonna whiz through some of these to give you some idea. This is the hyperspectral image uh, for cerulean blue, which is a, a cobalt stannate, a cobalt tin compound. And one of the things I'm in interested in that is, is just how much of that occurs in this blue shape here, right in the very center. It's a very strong, distinctive anchoring component in the composition and really has had a, a great deal of, of attention with a, a, co a cerulean blue paint. But you'll see that there's a general kind of vertical pattern to many of these cobalt blue um, forms that, uh, that, there's a, that paint is used uh, in a common gestural uh, fashion across the painting. And the same thing applies with many of the other paints. This is thylacinine blue, and you'll see that it's a narrow brush now, short linear strokes, again, mostly concentrated upper, uh, in, in the upper, or the left and upper left, and, and extreme right. He's using this paint to add sort of detail and definition to the linear shapes. Same way he's doing the, the, the thing with, the same thing with the thylacinine green, short, linear strokes and curvy linear strokes in a narrow brush. So this tells a lot about the manner of applications and much more method to it than uh, meets the eye. This is the umber picked out by the hyperspectral imaging and you'll see qu quite important I think for art historical study the kind of calligraphic uh, almost anthropomorphic figures that start seemingly on the right and progress and become more vague as the uh, as they work across and march across the, the canvas towards the, the left. This is the cobalt blue, and it, I'm going to whiz through this. You'll notice that this is a paint that comes very much with the final retouching stage of painting and stops oddly about two thirds of the way across with this strange up, upturned hook shape, which is, where is it? I can never see, I haven't got my glasses on. It's there, it's that one. There are, the reason for that remains obscure. It could be that he, the artist felt that this part of the composition, perhaps because the, the, um, the dark umber figures were not so well developed, um, the composition didn't need that final retouch, or it could be something very prosaic, like he ran out of paint. <laughs> I'm gonna whiz, just whiz through this and move on to, to wrap up. Um, because one of the things I, going back to this thing about staring at, at the wall, we've looked at, at mural a lot. And very early on in the, the technical study, Laura, myself, Yvonne, Tom, picked out this one area, uh, which is kind of upper left center, that seemed to have all the kind of paints and paint applications. And this became one of our areas of focus of interest. It's got everything, it's got the splatters, in red and yellow, it's got the pink stringy drip paint. It's got everything. And we, as I say, there, there, there are probably around 26 different applications of paint in this one area alone. And that seems to be representative of the whole. 
one of the major things that has come out of the, the, technical, the observation and technical study, and I want to stress the observational aspect of this, really the human eye properly calibrated and with the right databases behind it is a remarkably sensitive, discriminating uh, analytical instrument. Um, but one of the key things that came out of this is, is trying to work out what went on the canvas first. How did Pollock break the ice of that huge blank canvas? And we think that the, there are three main phases to the creation of the composition. There's a vigorous initial flurry, broad across the entire canvas, followed by a very prolonged, deliberate solidification of that uh, composition or the skeleton of the composition that occurred in that vigorous initial phase. And then a, a final stage of late retouching, which is really tidying up the, some of the mess that came about primarily because of the, the drippiness of the house paint. So this initial vigorous flurry is one of the uh, kind of key things. And another analytical imaging technique we use, uh, we got loaned this instrument from a consortium in, in the Low Countries, which is uh, X -ray, macro X-ray fluorescence scanning. Basically, it, ma it, it kind of will give you an elemental map of a, a target area, and I'm just going to whiz through. So this is our, our, our study area. If I go back, you look at the red spatter here. We can pick out a, a map for uh, mercury. That shows vermilion. We can pick out a map for cadmium that picks out the cadmium red, yellow, and lemon. Um, and we can pick out, distinguish the red from the... Uh, cadmium red from the cadmium yellow. I have to stop, so I'm going to go to my final slide. All of these are in the book, so. So, essentially, there's a very varied palette of, of artists, high quality artists, oil paint, very varied, different modes of application, but all with the painting vertical. We've got this very idiosyncratic use of, of uh, water-based house paint, and three phases of, of painting suggested a uh, vigorous initial flurry, in four paints, cadmium lemon, teal colored, uh, blue green, a red and a number, which is quite striking, and then a final retouching stage, and little paint specific deterioration. On that note, I will let Pollock's paint speak for itself, both here and up in the gallery. Thank you very much. This is the nicest room I've ever given a talk in. Um, Critics have frequently described Pollock's all over fields as absorbing or engulfing the viewer, as creating an irresistible sense of immersion. Paintings like number one, 1949, we are told, establish so powerful a continuity between viewer and painting that the distinction between them collapses, generating what the Gestalt psychologist Anton Ehrenzweig called undifferentiated oceanic envelopment. Ehrenzweig said Pollock's works enveloped the spectator inside the picture plane, producing a manic experience of mystic oneness. In them, he wrote, pictorial space advances and engulfs the viewer in a multi-dimensional unity where inside and outside merge. The assertion that Pollock's paintings expand beyond their frames is found in otherwise strong accounts of his work, notably Alan Caprouse, and the ubiquity of the cliche is striking. <laughs> Such descriptions are reserved not just for Pollock. One prominent critic sees Barnett Newman's Vir Heroic Sublimus as, quote, invading and displacing our sense of ourselves. And the effect is a brief but intense experience that begs to be called the sublime, loss of selfhood to something bigger and nobler than we are. If that loss of self sounds appealing, perhaps it is because we sometimes yearn to transcend our separateness or maybe we desire an art powerful enough to produce an experience of quasi-religious transcendence. In contrast to this sentiment, I think that the tendency to emphasize the viewer's feelings of experiential continuity participates in a kind of evasion or avoidance. It discounts what amounts to the very condition of the artist's meaning, namely, the autonomy of the work of art. My resistance to the continuity thesis is bound up with my commitment to the broader theoretical claim that the meaning of the work of art, and thus the artist's meaning, is independent of the viewer's contingent experience. I realize this sounds counterintuitive. After all, 
the possibility of our access to an artist's expression begins and ends in our experience of his art. But in a critical landscape dominated by the assertion that readers and viewers not only participate in, but actively produce the meaning of the texts and artworks they encounter, what remains an issue for criticism sympathetic to modernist claims about meaning is to decide which aspects of the experience of a work are relevant to its interpretation. What accounts like Aaron Zweig's and Caprow's do, I think, is undermine the criteria by which we can determine relevance. In conflating experience with meaning, they reject the idea that the artist frames and delimits the work of art. Taken to an extreme, the position implies that in our interpretation of a work, we are at liberty to take into consideration as relevant to its meaning the totality of our experiences of it. That would include all of the physical characteristics of the situation within which the object commands our attention, and especially the viewer's particular point of view. But since any two viewers will invariably see different things, their experiences of the object will always be different. We might conclude wrongly, I think, that the object just means different things to different people. For on that view, questions of what the work of art is and what it means are replaced by descriptions of the object's effects, and questions about understanding are replaced by questions about what the viewer feels or experiences. Admittedly, there is some truth to the continuity thesis. It captures something important about the way Pollock frames our experience of his work. But emphasizing that connection to the exclusion of the painting's dialectical moment of holding us apart misses something equally important. Pollock's investment in the separateness or autonomy of the work of art bears significantly on how we understand Mural. To explain the dramatic increase in the size of his paintings after 1948, scholars sometimes cite a remark Pollock made the year before, in which he declared the easel picture to be a dying form. His pictures would constitute a halfway state, and he pointed to Mural as providing a precedent for the possibilities of this new genre. He got the idea from Greenberg. Shortly before Pollock's statement, Greenberg had written that the painter, quote, pointed away beyond the easel to the mural, perhaps. The critic had been working on a longer analysis of the problem. In the crisis of the easel picture, he explained that historically, easel painting had been conditioned by its social function, that is, to hang on a wall and to provide the viewer with an illusionistic scene set within a box-like cavity. The stability of the genre had allowed artists to develop strong principles of internal unity that isolated their pictures and their dramatic effects from the context within which they were viewed. In fact, that box-like space had been key to establishing both the easel form's independence from its architectural setting and its difference from the merely decorative. The meaning and validity of the artist's expression, Greenberg thought, rested on establishing this dual distinction. But, he observed, modernist artists had undermined the conventions of illusionistic space and the traditional laws of composition that had guaranteed the self-sufficiency of the easel picture. From Manet through Cubism, modernists had contracted the box-like cavity, radically narrowing the illusionistic corridor that notionally occupies the far side of the picture plane. At the same time, the use of all-over techniques, such as the consistent weave of brush strokes by the Impressionists or the dispersed, faceted planes favored by Cubists, tended to reduce the picture to, quote, an undifferentiated surface, an effect that brought the painting to the brink of decoration, as if it were just a wallpaper pattern. And the problem was getting worse. Recent all-over paintings by Pollock and others threatened to dissolve into what Greenberg called a hallucinated uniformity. Pollock's dissolution of the picture into sheer texture, Greenberg wrote, had infected the whole notion of the easel painting with a fatal ambiguity. Following Greenberg, I suggest that Pollock's challenge in mural was to establish for his large-scale painting an autonomy analogous to that traditionally associated with easel painting. Consider a few key works in which autonomy is made into a kind of theme of the imagery. Stenographic figure depicts a single reclining nude whose sex is marked by a triangle wedged between splayed legs. But given what Kirk Barnado has called the willed confusions of this painting, it is also possible to see the composition, as many scholars have, as containing two figures, each of whom gesture to the other across a table. Over the canvas surface floats a scattering of calligraphic symbols, rudimentary signs, 
and numbers. Uh, the area between the figures is not so much defined as a volume by the flat shapes it contains as it is merely partitioned by them. Pollock's division of the surface into, into distinct planar sections, that is, separates each zone, despite the all-over scattering of marks that helps establish a consistent virtual picture plane, the other side of which the figures occupy their disjointed world. The effect is of a strangely uneven spacing that segregates the protagonists despite the frantic gesticulations they make to each other. I propose that stenographic fi figure establishes an analogy between the possible meaning of gestures conveyed by the separate figures to each other and the possible meaning of the painting itself for a viewer. But that meaning is not a matter of deciphering Pollock's coded stenography. Rather, it has to do with acknowledging separateness as the condition of communication that is, with acknowledging the painting's pictorial identity, just as we must acknowledge the identity of another as the source of our capacity to join in a communicative act. And in Pollock's case, that identity has to do with the artist's ability to frame an aspect of the world and our living experience of it as a painting. To unpack this idea, consider Pollock's use of the table. It is revealing that Pollock, between 1941 and 43, produced at least five paintings that contained tables, including Male and Female in Search of a Symbol and Guardians of the Secret. It has even been suggested, um, implausibly, that the Guardians is a, is a picture of the Pollock family gathered around a dinner table, and that its central picture within a picture, with its inverted stick figures, is a kind of miniature version of mural, also implausible. The table and its still life are central to Pollock's immediate artistic heritage from Cezanne through Picasso and Brock to Hans Hoffmann, but the table is significant to me for other reasons. Typically, when it is central to the composition of a painting, the space defined by the surface area of a table creates within the representation a special location that is meant to hold the beholder's interest. As a location, it creates a space within a space, a kind of spatial reserve that figuratively contains certain objects in a way that is analogous to how the framed picture itself contains a piece of the world. Picasso's fruit dish makes this double containment felt by making the quadrilateral surface that frames the still life within the representation correspond to the quadrant that frames an aspect of Picasso's studio. The conflation of the tabletop with the canvas is captured by the French word tableau, which designates both a table and a painting. In Male and Female in Search of a Symbol, terrible reproduction, uh, presents another version of the subject. Two figures bracket a tilted tabletop, against which Pollock features a collection of biomorphic forms and marks. The figures reach into or towards this trapezoidal plank. On the left, a narrow fin caresses a dismembered arm here. It extends the figure's reach across the table towards his companion, whose tubular appendage casts an undulating line that meets and helps define the arm. The table stages a complex migration of body parts. Then again, I'm not convinced that the arm I've mentioned is actually dismembered. It might be attached to a figure whose lower half is simply transparent and whose round head, here, transparent bottom, uh, is made nearly invisible by its continuity with the ground of the painting. These figure ground indeterminacies contribute to the sense of a kind of spatial reserve or dimension felt to emanate from beneath or behind the table. The right hand figure's insistent frontality causes the table to which he's attached by a straight contour line to rotate up towards the vertical plane. That upturning conveys a kind of salience or plentitude, even as conventional cues of depth are eliminated. Pollock's concern with the complex dimensionality of flat paintings is illuminated by considering the related problem of distance and proximity in Picasso's La Nessuse in relation to the moon woman. Each figure gazes at flowers. They each have a disc crescent eye and a moon-shaped profile. What interests me is Picasso's stark silhouetting of the woman's face against the shadow of her straw hat, as if he is setting the moon against the night sky. Indeed, I take the set of three asterisks along the brim of her sun hat to represent stars, and the radiating pattern of short paint strokes to represent not only the weave of the hat's construction, but also a sun's rays, which emanate from the small orb centered at its apex. 
which is to say that if we are meant to see the woman's profile as resembling a moon, then Picasso is contained within her setting in altogether vast celestial space, bringing the very distant into close proximity, not only to her body, but also to the anticipated view of her portrait. In fact, I see the white asterisks in her bouquet and in the basket to suggest both seeds and stars, transforming the flower's buds, as well as the hollow space of her basket, into vistas of the firmament suddenly open to our close inspection. Finally, I see the woman's fingers, which so pointedly hold together a bunch of stems to pinch the trunk of a palm tree on the horizon with the effect that its form bridges near and far. The subject of the moon woman fits the theme of distance and proximity insofar as the moon has effects we witness close at hand, such as on the tides and by analogy on the human soul. Pollock, for instance, believed, in the vas believed that the vacillations of the lunar cycle helped explain his own tumultuous personality. Here, I'm interested in the way that, po that Pollock preserves dimensional effect within the flatness inscribed by figurative and non-figurative marks, such as the squiggle near the moon woman's left leg, uh, which you can see is somehow integrated into the kind of mottled red and pink beneath it. In its dual role of being in the field and on the surface, the mark compresses atmospheric depth to the surface planarity established by the moon woman's flat diagrammatic armature. I furthermore take the rectangle on her right side to suggest a space within a space that is not unlike the space claimed by the table and other works of this moment. Above, stenographic figure prompted me to draw an analogy between the communicative possibilities of the figure's gestures and the viewer's interpretation of the work of art. In a related way, Pollock employs in The Moon Woman a motif of distance and proximity in order to suggest something about the viewer's multifaceted mode of access to the work of art, which is at once close, the object is, after all, just there facing us, and remote. We don't understand it immediately or automatically by somehow merging with it. But what has changed between the two works is the basis of the analogy. In the earlier picture, the analogy depends on our identifying what is happening in the scene. Two figures gesture to one another across a divide. In The Moon Woman, the analogy is sustained not only by the depicted scene, but also through the painting's perceptual effects, which is to say that Pollock seems to have recognized that the conventions or norms that might guarantee painting's autonomy after the desolation of easel painting could be generated out of the unique spatial and perceptual effects of his painted fields, not just by his imagery. Which brings me to Mural, a painting that renders pictorial dimension so insistently flat over such a large surface area that it compromises imaginative projections into depth. That nearly paradoxical effect results in part from the complex lateral flow of pictorial energy between, but not quite around, the predominant quasi-vertical black umber lines and arcs. Although those lines do not exactly enclose figural profiles, it would be willful to deny that their structural role isn't in some way analogous to a bodily or perhaps skeletal holding up of the picture as a manifestly vertical plane, which is to say that those linear entities contribute definitively to Mural's resolutely frontal address. But I'm interested less in seeing the circular forms along the top edge as representing the literal heads of stick figures marching across the surface than I am in the difference between the kind of space those loops contain and the kind, or I'm tempted to say, modality of space elsewhere in the painted field. In their catalog essay, the Getty conservators discuss Pollock's use of light background reserves the appearance of a primed but otherwise unpainted ground. I'd like to draw out the consequences for interpretation of that observation. I'm attracted to the word reserve. The term connotes a kind of holding back. I see these looped reserves along the top especially. Uh, as spaces Pollock meant to dissociate from others he created. The space there is pointedly empty its flatness is felt to be a physical characteristic of the material surface we are, after all, looking at. But there's another kind of flatness Mural alludes to. 
Perhaps Pollock calls our attention to the literally flat in these areas in order to distinguish it from the pictorially flat. He frequently does this with blue selvage threads, which mark a difference between the canvas and the representation, as in Lavender Mist in number 27, and a very tiny Pollock we have in San Antonio, which is about five, feet by, five inches by eight inches here. In various zones just below the reserves of actual canvas, Pollock offers us the pictorial alternative. Between the more linear elements, he used an off-white trade paint to fill in viscid and almost gummy passages. The surrounding lariats and swirls seem to fasten into them, binding the field and its ground to recreate the painting's flatness by preserving the salience or modality of space behind the painting's field. Within that field, there is a global distribution of concentrated pictorial energies, a kind of ubiquitous exchange of intensities that modulates the surface. Three key technical choices heighten the effect. First, the initial paint gestures were not, as many of us had assumed, the elongated structuring lines, but rather broadly applied patches of red, yellow, dark teal with blue, and umber. Although that patchwork is obscured by subsequent layers of paint, the logic of starting the work with a zone organization might help explain the sense of the field as an aggregate plane, the vitality of which is felt to be infused in every mark and to confront the viewer at every point. Second, Pollock intended the surface to have differential reflective values. The 1972 conservation effort, which included varnishing the surface, reduced the differences between the matte and glossy paints Pollock originally used. Their dissimilar sheen would have made, and now do make, passages of contrasting luster. The result creates a fluctuating optical perception, the pulse of which reinforces the plasticity of the image, an image that is seemingly responsive, as Michael Fried put it, to one's own act of looking. The effect of a kind of flexible visuality that both connects but also counterposes the viewer and the image is reinforced by a third technical decision. Pollock offers a pointed contrast between wet into wet areas and dry passages. The former seem blurrier than those featuring a progressive layering of colors so that the viewer seems to achieve and then lose focus as her eye moves across the canvas, prompting her to attempt to adjust her eyes and perhaps even change position to optimize her visual acuity. These are the perceptual effects of mural as I see them, and now we know a good deal more about how Pollock created them. The content of that perception, what the mode of vision instantiated by the painting means, is the ongoing target. I can only gesture towards a conclusion comparatively. From one perspective, it is possible to see mural not as a transition to the later drip paintings, but as discontinuous with them. The later works might share in the project of separateness I've announced, but it is a project that Pollock must achieve in the face of his producing through a, through a new technique, radically different perceptual effects, namely through tempting a viewer to project herself into a loosened atmospheric space opened up by the skeins of such works as number 28. I have in mind the way Pollock paints the all over field to appear as if it anticipates and addresses yet simultaneously attempts to seal itself against a viewer's penetrating gaze. The network of reflective black enamel pools and their linear tributaries, that's the last application of paint or near last application, renders a pattern of tracery striking in its luster or sheen that intervenes as a kind of gliding scrim that appears to float between the viewer and the surface of the canvas. That virtual middle plane directs our visual scanning laterally and inhibits the viewer, at least initially, from gazing into and perhaps losing himself in the ambiguous depth on the other side. In other words, number 28 establishes through its pictorial effects a kind of distance between the viewer and the work of art. At least part of its content, as with the content of mural, has to do with making available to visual perception a certain proposition, namely that its separateness is the condition of Pollock's possible expression. Its autonomy, then, should be understood not in a narrow sense as the isolation of the, of the work of art from the world, but rather as the independence of its meaning from our contingent experiences of the painting. Thank you. Uh, 
Susan Futterman, do we know where the canvas was bought? Um, I think that that question actually is going to be addressed in an upcoming talk, so I think we'll, we'll, we won't answer Wait, that question. Wait, wonderfully, thoroughly. <laughs> There's one in the back, all the way in the back. <clears throat> Diana Wilson, how did he control so much of his work when it looks like a dribble and a splatter and instead of a paintbrush? How long would you like to speak now? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one of the the major vast majority of mural is painted rather conventionally by brush. In fact, the bulk of what you see is brushwork. Really two principal sizes of brush, one about two to two and a half inches, which is the majority of the larger, broader work. And then you see a lot of it, it particularly in the sort of middle phase of painting, uh, quite methodical, I wouldn't say systematic, but but regular, methodical work, adding detail and contour to the linear shapes with uh, a much smaller brush, probably uh, half inch wide. Um, so very conventional application. We found no evidence at all in the technical study for the work going horizontal. As far as we can tell, it was done entirely vertically, which is consistent with our knowledge of the studio space. Um, so even those splatters of paint, and there are th three or four principal colours, there's vermilion, cadmium lemon, cadmium yellow, medium, and particularly the pink stringy paint that's very um, distinctive um, surface quality. It's very, very distinctive mode of application. We still think that was done uh, vertically applied by flicking paint at, at, at the surface. Um, there's, if you've not been to the gallery yet, there's a video showing what we think of a reconstruction of how that was done. And it's all to do with getting the right consistency of the paint by adding additional components to the, to the oil medium, a combination of boiled oil, boiled oil and turpentine with a definite kind of flick that produces that quality of paint. So I think in, in this case, that although there are some superficial sort of resemblances to the later drip painting, here it's, it's, it's splatter at the vertical surface. Um, and quite regular, again, if you, if you look at the distribution of some of the vermilion splatters, you can see that he's going across and doing a series of gestures of splattering the paint at the surface at fairly regular intervals and at different registers or tiers through the, the, the depth of the, or the height of the composition. So I think it's, it, it looks very complex and um, chaotic, but I, th I think one of the real findings of the study uh, is that there's a lot more method, particularly in that once, once the skeleton of the, the composition is defined in that very early vigorous phase, the rest is protracted, prolonged and quite deliberate. And I say prolonged because this is majority, mostly in oil paint. Now oil paint does take several days to dry, to become um, touch dry, to the point where you can apply a, a, another layer of paint by brush without disturbing what's been put down already. And one of the, I didn't really get a chance to say, one of the striking features of all the cross-section analysis is that there's remarkably little wet in wet working. There is some, as, as Michael pointed out, in, in particular areas. But a lot of the applications are wet paint going on to at least touch dry paint. So the myth of this, the whole thing being done in one creative burst overnight, I think just cannot be sustained by, by the, um, the, the, the technical findings that really show um, extensive use of oil paint in phases of painting over quite a prolonged period. Um, and I think the, the, the big finding is, is just how deliberate that developmental part of the, com, uh, of the painting com, uh, process actually was. I don't know if any, one of my colleagues wants to add anything to that. 
Does that answer the question? Hope so. No. <laughs> My question was, how do you control it? You're saying it was deliberate, and I, I am, in my sense, agree, yes, it was deliberate, but the splattery and some of the words are so precise, and when you do that with a brush, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, I think a lot of it is to do with a sort of rhythmic um, gestural process. I think he gets into a groove, he gets into a rhythm. And actually, I mean, this issue of rhythm and temporal progression across the work does come up. You, you see that to a certain extent in the dark umber figures. There's a, they create a visual ryth rhythm to the composition, but I think that also implies a degree of rhythmic application of paint, that he's, particularly in those more broadly applied, he's getting in, it's almost, I wouldn't say dance, but there's a, a sort of repetitive rhythmic approach to the, the gesture of, of applying the paint, both into the sort of linear applications of paint, but also in, in the splatters. I think it's, he gets into a pattern of application that allows a degree of precision in, in, in the application. Of, of paint that is mobile. Uh, and I think it's to do with that rhythmic quality of, of the pro and, and remarkably uniform across the surface. The, I think that's one of the intriguing things about the composition, how balanced it is in terms of, of, of paint application. There, there's not a lot of, you know, apart from particularly the, the top um, left that Michael talked about, there's a fairly uniform uh, application of paint. What he does um, in, in certain parts of the process are carried out quite methodically across the entire composition. Thanks, Alan. Other questions? Good. Over here. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> too close. Um, I'm Charles Kajar. And I actually had a question about the last presentation. It seemed like we discussed kind of what meaning isn't, but I don't feel like we got to understanding how the correct interpretation of the meaning of the painting might be. And I was wondering if you could expand on that. Good point. <laughs> You've identified the ruse. <laughs> yes, well, um, you know, in terms of uh, when you're making claims about what mural means, you know, um, one of the things, well, first of all, I'm not quite sure I can uh, put it into a package yet and say, this is it, this is what I think it means. Um, this, this kind of investigation that I was doing today was more um, uh, driven by um, a desire to kind of uh, stake out what the conditions of the possible meaning are. And for me, that has everything to do with the uh, way that Pollock establishes the independence of his artworks from uh, the contingent context of their exhibition, uh, as well as from the viewer's experience at large. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult question. I mean, yesterday we had a long discussion about uh, future installations of mural and whether or not it should be put into a room that was the same size as Peggy Guggenheim's room. Uh, you know, and I worry a little bit about so completely identifying the meaning of a work of art uh, with the conditions of our access to it, um, that it, it seems to lead down to a, a road I, I can't quite imagine how we would ever bracket it off. Because if the space of the room starts to matter, uh, then so does the smells of the room. You know, and the temperature of the room, and the acoustics of the room, and whether the acoustics of the room are modified by four or five bodies or ten bodies shoved in there. Does it smell like smoke in Peggy Guggenheim's apartment? I'm sure it does. Do I have to have a cigarette to understand mural better? It's, it, do, it doesn't allow me the... <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't give me the security I, I seem to think I need um, for um, constraining the conditions of what a meaning of a work of art is. So in essence, there's there are two parts of this painting. One kind of like gestures towards how I might establish 
uh, the meaning, or sorry, how I might um, uh, make a case for the way that mural establishes its independence from its architectural context based on its unique perceptual effects and the particular ways that Pollock has uh, framed that as an internally consistent work of art. Um, then the other part is trying to figure out exactly what that would mean. So I don't really have a good answer for you yet, but I'm trying to work there. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we're running a bit late this morning. So I'm gonna thank all three speakers of this, this session for really fascinating and interesting talks. Mm-hmm.